This is Overdrive with Hayes, Noodles, and the O-Dog on TSN 1050. Drive continues, brought to you by FanDuel, bringing you everything from the opening line to the final score. Brian Hayes, Dave Poulin. Got Brad Lidge coming up here in a moment. Get Brad's take on what happened with the Jays over the weekend. You mentioned the 12 games that they have forthcoming here, Pooley. Washington, Oakland, Colorado. Last place. Kansas last place, City. Last place. Terrible teams. Washington just out of last place. Yep. Although they've been a little bit warm lately, but that can't matter to the Jays. They're a team you look at, I mean, you flip them on and you expect more. That's what you do. Yet it's you got September. Vladdy coming up. You got, I know. It's September later this week. And if you're going to tell me the pitching has been as good as it's been mm-hmm. and you augmented the bullpen and I mean, we've got the ultimate bullpen guy coming up, but they got a pretty good bullpen here right now. Yeah, they do. Multiple closers. Different role players. Yeah. They've got what it takes. And they can't get it done. And they have consistently not got it done all year. And what happened in the ninth yesterday, albeit deeper in your lineup, but Jansen steps up, hits a double. You start, it's a tie ball game at home against a team in Cleveland that is ready to be had. Let's put it that way. Three guys playing after just being either picked up on waivers or outright released by the other team in the starting line. Exactly. They're filling holes over there. Totally filling holes. And Jansen gets on. Biggio can't lay down a bunt properly. And he's really good at doing that. And, yeah, well, exactly. Like, his dad's in the Hall of Fame, had 3,000 hits. But he's, that's what he does. Exactly. Stuff like that. He can't get the fundamentals right, which says something seriously is wrong in terms of the approach. Espinal swinging on a 3-0 count is the most absurd decision I've seen. And and anyone suggesting that he went against orders to do that, there is no chance. He knows who he is. He's a replacement-level player. He's a utility guy coming off the bench. There is no way he is waving off whatever is coming in from the dugout. He got the green light. He swung at ball four, hits into a double play, See you later. Awful execution. That is on the manager last night. But it's also on the players to actually achieve what they're supposed to achieve. So what night was it that Schneider snapped? It was after Friday's game, I believe. Mm -hmm. When he went off. About, we're not going to tolerate this anymore. They come back. They have a good game Saturday. Right back. And then last night, exactly. That's the little things. And, like, everyone's got a different viewpoint of what has gone wrong here. Again, they still have 31 games left. They're only two and a half games out. They got a soft schedule coming up. The season is not over. The beauty of pro sports and especially baseball is you have a lot of time at redemption. But that means the flip side is you have a lot of time to continue to disappoint and avoid that redemption. And something to chew on is brought to you by Boston Pizza, the best place for any family meal. Plus, for the month of September, kids eat free with minimum purchase when you dine in. So grab the kids and hustle into your local BP tonight. We're asking today, we've been asking online, if the Jays miss the playoffs, who is it on the most? The players, the coaching staff, or the management? And I have a pretty general rule. when you can. We're talking about teams that have legitimate expectations. If you go into a season where you know your team's awful, then the players understand who they are, and there's not much that they can do to change that. But if you're talking about... Teams that are in the upper echelon of any league, any sport, and the expectations are to make the playoffs. Generally speaking, if there is a failure to achieve that, at least 70% is on the players. At least. That opens the door for maybe 10% on coaching staff, 10% on management, 10% on being unlucky or injury riddled. I'm even harder on the players than you are. Well, I'm saying that is a stock number. With this cast of characters in Toronto, it's way higher than that. Like, for me, the amount of people blaming Ross Atkins for this, to me, is staggering. They have the best team ERA in baseball, or they have up until recently. Mm-hmm. They have a staff. The Alec Manoa situation, that's not on That's not on Ross Atkins. Who could possibly predict your ace is going to implode the way he's implode? Well, and, and that would just be a bonus right now, because as you said, they still have everybody studs. else has been... Their bullpen's been very good. Gossman's been 
great. Yes, the Varsho trade looks horrible right now. That's because Dalton Varsho has been awful. They didn't just pluck he's him out come of nowhere. On lately, though. A little bit better. Defensively, he's been very good. Yes, you hate the fact that they moved on from Marino. The reason they did that was because they had Kirk. Kirk's been terrible. That's on the player. Vladdy Guerrero Jr., for a guy of superstar status or superstar labeling, has had one of the biggest disappointing seasons I can recall in a long time. The labeling and status Not, are very two different. Very different. Very, things. very different. Chapman's been awful since the first month of the season at the plate. Their, their inability to score with runners in scoring position has been well documented. Yes, coaching staff can apply there. Yes, their approach at the plate. Yes, their game plan. But for me, it's like 90% on the players, at least, because they're underachieving. And yet it seems like a lot of people in this city and this market are looking at, you know, management needs to be turned over if they missed. Maybe the manager's got to go somewhere. I, I think the... Well, hey, let me tell you something. The fans have kept coming, too. They're averaging 37 Oh, they're, they're filling that park, man. They are filling... And they're, they're going to continue next year when the next wave of renovations kick in. We like renovations, apparently. Toronto likes renovations. We like construction. We like construction. <laughs> we love construction in Toronto. Orange cones at the stadium. That's probably <laughs> how I would define the city of Toronto. Orange. And if you don't love it, you better learn to, because it doesn't matter. You're stuck. Construction's coming. Here is longtime MLB closer, MLB Network radio host, one of our favorites, Brad Lidge, joining us here on the Maple Toyota Hotline. Brad, we've had you on all year. We really appreciate you doing this as always, man. Um, the Jays, they're, they're a frustrating group. Like, can you wrap your head around what's going on with this team right now? Well, I, I mean, it is, I'm sure, very frustrating if you're a Jays fan right now. And, you know, here you are with a – with an elite caliber team, you know, in terms of roster, but especially with, you know, pitching and rotation and just, you know, it's not translating into wins. It's funny, you know, we were, I was just doing a radio show talking about how the Padres are not able to hit at all with runners in scoring position. And they have a very, you know, star studded lineup as well. So I guess, I guess it could be worse is, uh, is what I'm saying. At least the Blue Jays are still in the mix. Yeah. Um, but I, I do think, look, I, I do think they're still going to make a, a really solid run here. It's crazy to think that a team this talented is on the outside looking in right now. Um, but I'll tell you what, if, uh, if ball clubs like the Rangers can't piece things together and figure it out and their bullpen's a mess, then they might uh, you know, fall down to the Blue Jays. Uh, but I, I do think the Jays obviously are going to have to pick it up a little bit. Um, but you, know, you said it, they're, they're not scoring with runners in scoring position. And, and I think just offensively this year, uh, it's, it's, been, it's been a battle. And I, you know, yeah, Vladdy's been, been having a, a tough go at it, but it's, it's not just him. So, you know, collectively they're not firing on all cylinders. And maybe, maybe if he gets going the way, uh, you know, Julio Rodriguez has in, in mm -hmm. Seattle, then all of a sudden the, the Blue Jays rip off a ton of wins in a row. I could see that being the case. Well, when John Schneider got the job, he came up and he was barking nonstop about fundamentals and, and a big boy attitude. And we're getting rid of the home run jacket and we're going to be a serious club. And I think what he was hammering away on was like basically fundamentals, where if you hammer away on those enough in the spring, by the end of August, it's going to be routine. And I don't know if you caught the ninth inning last night, but Biggio can't yeah. lay down a bunt. Espinal swinging at th he's, he's a three and zero count. He swings at ball four, then hits into a double play. Like if that's still happening in late August, there's no way the manager's messaging is getting across. Right. Like what, what does it say about players yeah. and management and, and them maybe not being on the on the same page right now? Well, I, I think it also says it's 2023 uh, and, you know, things like, you know, laying down bunts. You can you can practice those things in spring training all you want. But when the regular season rolls around and you haven't done things like that for months, uh, it's not easy to all of a sudden switch that into gear. And I think in, you know, in baseball now, you just, yeah, I know we're trying to get back to small ball a little bit this year. And in certain ways, you know, teams have in, in some capacity, stealing bases and stuff like that. But bunting guys over still is not a big part of any team's, you know, recipe or game plan. And, and I just think that, you know, if you're trying to all of a sudden, you know, you have a team that mashes and, and I know you want every manager wants good fundamentals. Every manager is going to try and instill that in spring training. But if that's not really been your MO all year and then all of a sudden you think you're going to flip the switch and, and have great fundamentals and, and do the little things that uh, you, know, you haven't done for months, good luck. And, uh, you know, I don't see the Blue Jays being able to execute that a ton. I don't see any teams really being able to execute that a ton because 
it's just not something that you've done for months. And, and again, you know, by this point in the season, you're detached from spring training, you know, enough to where you can't just say, you know, that that's something we practiced and now what's wrong with these players. Well, if you don't keep up those skills, if you're not doing it all year long, you're not going to all of a sudden be able to execute here, you know, the week before September. Brad, the one thing that has been here all year has been pitching and that's with the absence of Alec Manoa, but that situation has kind of turned a little strange in the last couple of weeks. And we've always seen young pitchers go through struggles. I mean, that that part is not common, but, but the way this has all been handled is a little bit different than usual. It seems like. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's all really unfortunate. And, you know, I, I think, you know, for me, um, you know, when Manoa was sent down initially and there were all these, you know, like talks of, hey, you know, this is what happened with Roy Holiday and Doc, you know, he started and he, and he ramped it back up and then look what happened. This will be good for Manoa in the long run. I don't know. You know, I, I don't I don't know where he's at right now. It's 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 obviously very tough to have to go through something like this. And, uh, you know, I didn't. Like, I'm not going to put this on him, but I didn't necessarily love all the, you know, all-star game stuff that was happening last year. And then, you know, having all these like, you know, midweek conversations, uh, you know, regularly with ESPN and stuff going into the season. I just felt like for for a young starting pitcher, you know, you need to establish yourself for a few years before, you know, you kind of commit to a lot of uh, public stuff because uh, as baseball as we all know, it it humbles you. And uh, this year, I don't wish that on anybody, what Manoa is going through. So, um you know, it's fortunately uh, for the Blue Jays, they've, you know, Ryu is back. He's throwing the ball well. And uh, I, it is amazing. You're right. They've pitched well all year despite the Manoa situation. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, if for some reason the Jays don't make the postseason this year, people are just going to look back and scratch their heads and say, how did that happen? How did we miss on a year where our rotation was good enough to get really, really deep into the postseason? How did we not even get into the postseason? So it's interesting because you've talked about you know, the Vladdies and Bo and Springer, and then you talk about the pitching side. It sounds like a team that no one would want to play in the playoffs if they can get there. Uh, it's exactly right. I mean, they're, uh, you know, and I'm not trying to be biased here. Obviously, the Phillies, my former team, are, are a team like the Blue Jays and that they have a really great top of the rotation punch, but the rotation in general is deeper than you think. And then, of course, maybe if the offense hasn't displayed firepower at all times, they're certainly capable of doing it. And that's the way it is with, with the Blue Jays. Like if they, you know, if a flatty does get, uh, you know, kind of locked in the last month of the season, I think that kind of loosens up everybody else and it takes pressure off of everybody else. And then all of a sudden they become a monster and, you know, they're, they're a wild card team going in that nobody wants to face in a short series. And, uh, you know, it really comes down to, you know, what you have at the top of the rotation of those short series. And obviously for the Blue Jays, they have plenty at the very top and they can get past a lot of teams because of that. So, you know, going into the postseason, it almost it doesn't matter too much to me how they're seeded. It's going to be obviously, you know, nearly impossible to catch the Rays in Baltimore. Although I do expect Baltimore uh, to take a step back without uh, Felix Bautista, but it's going to be nearly impossible to catch those teams. What they just need to do is focus on getting there because you know, once the Jays are there, they will be a very dangerous team. I mean, they'll have a really good chance at, at you know potentially even representing the American League if they can just get their foot in the door. With Brad Lidge, yeah. I think we've all consistently thought that all year, yet it just has never looked like it consistently, <laughs> Brad. Right? Like it, there just has not been a run for this team where you've said, or I've come out of it thinking that's the team. Like that, and maybe they are who they are, right? Like Bill Parcells always used to say, you are what your record says you are, and you are what your production mm-hmm. line says you are. It's almost like there's no panic because they're, they are so capable. Yeah, well, and, which could be a curse in it, a way. Yeah, it can be, unless internally they're looking at it saying, actually, who we are, like, this is it. Like, we're, because now they're dealing with injuries, right? Chapman's gone on the IL. Yep. Shet's out of the lineup tonight. Bo's been lingering with this leg injury. Now it's a quad. It was a knee before. Like, if Bo goes on the IL, that's been your consistent bat all year. That's, that's your leader. That's your yep. guy. If he has another IL stin, I don't know how they recover from that, Brad. I really don't. Well, you know, for a team that hasn't hit like they're capable of all year, if you lose Bichette, it's definitely going to be tricky. But, Mm -hmm. um, you know, that being said, I mean, I'll give you two examples of, you know, on how it could go either way. You know, with the Padres, people said, just wait, just wait, just wait. And and it never has. And now it's too late. Uh, But with Seattle, people were saying, just wait, you know, Mm -hmm. offensively, at least, you know, Julio Rodriguez, he'll come around at some point. He's too good. He's too talented. And then all of a sudden he did about a month ago, and he's been carrying the team on his, on his shoulders. And, 
you know, all of a sudden they've ripped off all the games they have. They're freaking in first place in the American League West now, which is just crazy to think about. Still up in the air which way the Blue Jays are going to go because, you know, you can look at the Padres and, and you can look at Seattle. It could go either way. Um, but I do think they're, they're, more, they're certainly more capable than, than a team like the Padres. And, and, and you know, and, and not just because of the talent level, but because, you know, they've, they've actually been able to at least – withstand a lot of, of a lackluster production and here they still are as many games over 500 as they still are. Um, but you know, it, it's another thing to kind of think about. They haven't played their best baseball yet this year. That's true. They have not had any surges that we thought they were going to have, but what if they do get hot in September? What if they collectively like Bichette starts to feel help? Maybe he even goes on the 10 day, but maybe they hang right there, uh, you know, close to the wild card spot. And then all of a sudden they get hot and they go into the postseason as a hot team Seattle, I mean, it's great that they're playing as well as they have, but, you know, there's also time for them to cool off before mm-hmm. they get into the postseason. So it's one thing to peak right now, uh, but they have to keep up a high level of play. And, and you know, maybe Toronto is the team that, that flips the switch in the second half of September and they and they barely get in, but they're the hottest team in baseball. Yeah. Well, and if you're the third wild card, you're playing someone from the central. Like, you're going to be in a good spot doing that. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's with, exactly right. With Brad Lidge, you, you mentioned the AL West, and obviously Seattle is probably the prominent story terms of a team aspect but there is a certain player that plays in that division that has basically taken over everything the last few days and that would be Shohei Otani um you know Otani has he's a unicorn he's the best player in the world and now his arm is blown up again and yeah I'm curious Brad like in terms of putting the finances on the table like we we've had prominent insiders in baseball saying this guy's going to make 600 million plus if he can't pitch for another year and a half. He can't pitch until he's 31. Yeah. What's yeah. that? What is, what is this free agency going to look like? What did that injury possibly do to Shohei Otani and the free agent market? Well, it's it certainly, you know, in, in my opinion, probably if, if 600 million was the number and it just seems ludicrous, but that could have been, mm-hmm. I, I mean, it could have been 550 or 600 million. It probably takes away about a hundred million out of that with, with the, with the thought and the hope that, you know, when he does come back, he'll still be able, even if we have to monitor the pitching, we, if we have to go to a six man rotation, um, you know, whatever team gets him, we can still use him as a pitcher. The stuff is still there. He's obviously had a great you know, success when he's on the, when he's on the mound. So, so we still want to pay for that upside. Um, and then obviously what he brings to the table as an offensive player, uh, you know, honestly, if he was just focusing on hitting now, I mean, I know he did this a couple of years ago, but if he was just focused on hitting right now, there's no reason in the world to think he wouldn't hit 50 home runs every year. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what's that worth? I mean, obviously as a designated hitter, it's not worth as much as a position player, but you know, that being said, if you're getting 50 home runs a year and everyone in the world is watching this guy play, and then at some point he's able to get back on the mound and, maybe stitch together, you know, 15 to 20 starts a year, uh, it's still worth way, way more than anybody else in the game. So it may have cost him. It certainly did cost him. And, you know, I guess you can feel bad for him to a certain extent, but right. he's still going to get, uh, you know, probably close to 500 million. He's it's still going to be the biggest contract we've ever seen by a lot because everyone, uh, you know, everyone in America, everyone, uh, you know, back home for him, everyone loves the guy regardless of if he's doing both things or if he's going to have to miss a year and a half or whatever pitching, they're still going to love him. They're still going to tune in to watch him. So, and all that being said, I think the angels are more back in play now than they've ever been because something like this can, can honestly make you think about, you know, he's got his home out there and uh, you know, the the angels let him kind of stitch together however he wants to do things. And uh, there's a certain comfort level. So this, this injury might've put the angels back toward the forefront of landing him. Always great catching up with you, Brad. We appreciate it. We'll do it again soon. All right, guys. Sounds great. Take care. Brad Lidge, longtime MLB closer, MLB Network radio host, joining us here on the Maple Toyota Hotline. Build your next dream Toyota at Maple Toyota. Check out Maple Toyota's pre-owned inventory arriving daily. It's time to Toyota. Visit mapletoyota.com. What's interesting about that angle, the Angels angle, is that the Angels GM over the weekend revealed that the team wanted Otani to go for an MRI, and Otani and his camp declined like prior to his arm eventually giving out when he had skipped the start, the previous start, which had a lot of people wondering, like, why would you reveal that information? Like if that was private between the two parties, why would you go public with that? Unless you're trying to either save face or cut or, bait or trade him. Well, it's over now. I mean, that's the thing. No, that, no, but I mean, I, I think it might be, we, we're out. 
Like we no, we're not we we can't pay six hundred million anymore. Well, I don't think this guy's arm isn't going to hold up, right? Like the fact is with Otani, yes, the bat is remarkably captivating. So is Mike Trout's. Exactly. There's a lot of power bats. If you're if you're if you're a great bat and you're going to be thirty years old, and you DH, that's worth a lot of money. Not, Not setting a that. new standard. What made Otani Otani was that he could pitch. That's what pushed him in a different stratosphere. That's what made him almost a, a traveling circus. I wrote a great piece on I read a great piece on that, and it said the human body won again. Yeah. Well, this will be likely the second time he's got to go for Tommy like John. The human body, despite his skill, despite mm. his abilities, the human body said, no, you can't You can't continue to do this. Well, remember he had that day in Detroit uh, prior to coming up here to play the Jays where he was scheduled to pitch against Toronto. Originally, they thought it would be the Sunday. Then things got scattered, and it was supposed to be the Friday night. And then a game got rained out on the Thursday in Detroit. They played a doubleheader on the Friday. This would have been maybe a, three weeks ago to a month. And he pitched a gem in the first game. Like, I think it was a nine-inning shutout. And then hit, I believe, two home runs in the afternoon. In, in the second game, yeah. And then I want to say he left in the afternoon on fatigue. And yet it was it was just after the deadline, I believe, or just after they had made the Giolito trade. And it was like, all right, you're in. You got to go get those wins. Look at the great Otani. And then he left that game in the afternoon. I remember being on the air saying, what does this mean for him you coming up here? think that was the timing on well, the... Well, I don't know if that's when he... I don't remember the injury or why he left. Because that would have been before the trade deadline. But it was basically this guy, look what he's doing in back-to-back games, same day. And then the next night, he was in the lineup against the Jays. And it was almost like, we're, we got to run this guy into the ground well, here. Even when he was we're diagnosed, going he played the next game. Right, exactly. He hit in the next game. And after Tommy John, he kept hitting... Like this guy, he's a freak when it comes to being a ball, like a guy. He's a he's a player. He's a pure athlete that wants to play. Like I have a massive amount of appreciation for that. But if you're right, it feels like the body won again, and the combination of the Angels being so desperate and so poorly built around him that it just it drove him into the ground. Like he had to keep going and going and going. Like a guy. A guy that pitches and throws that many ba- – like, the, he should never be playing the next day. Like, it's, I wonder if in retrospect they look back on it and say, there should have been something built in where basically he doesn't hit the day before he pitches and the day after he Well, pitches. what's really funny about Or that whatever is, it was supposed to be. When you look at those schedules, and I've known some guys that, you know, and you say, well, what did you do today? Well, I had a light jog. Yeah. <laughs> a light jog. Mm-hmm. That's what you do the day after you pitch. Yeah. You're spent. That's it. And this guy's going up and giving you four or five ABs. Yeah. And it sucks because naturally it was probably going to break down. And I don't know what that free agency looks like now for Otani. Because I just, I can't picture owners around baseball saying, we're going to invest in a guy who's going to be 30. Who's, a, I believe, about to go through a second Tommy John, or we think that's probably going to happen. I don't know if that arm's going to be there anymore. So are you paying for the pitcher and the batter, or are you pitching now, for only the bat? The history if, of that surgery is you come back stronger, but very often it's at 24, 25 years old, mm-hmm. 31 years old. Yeah. Now, Verlander changed the game. When Verlander just went through it, came back, and won a Cy Young, still a beast. Maybe, like, Not science five and technology. Not times a night. Yeah. Well, that's the difference, <laughs> right? Like, at some point, it felt like he was going to have to choose. But even the mental side of that. Think of the mental side of having to do that. There's no rest. Zero. Yeah. That was the amazing thing about that day in Detroit. Was that he threw a a complete game shutout and then hit two bombs in the afternoon. It's awesome. Incredible. But about three weeks later, it's like, all right, this guy's whole career is going to take a different turn, man. And, And I just, I wonder if the Angels now are looking at it. And it's so typical that the Angels are so poorly run. They should have traded him at the trade deadline and got as much of a haul as you could possibly get. Because look at them. They're a disaster. They've lost a ton. They're out of it. And now I wonder if that owner is going to say, we got to cut bait completely because I'm not paying this guy. I'm sure they've gone down a certain path with negotiations. Like, I'd be curious if you've ever been in a situation like that where 
both parties are talking and there's an understanding this is kind of what it's going to look like. And, and then a then major a injury hits where you know the player's like, doesn't change anything for me. I'm still asking for the same thing and I want the same thing. I would guess the team's probably like, eh, it kind of changes something for us. Yeah. You factor it in has everything. To. And, and you, if you had that discussion with a winning team, in this case, you're having it with a team that hasn't won anything mm -hmm. with or without the player. It doesn't have a history of winning. It doesn't have... And they haven't been able to build teams around superstars. They haven't proven anything that shows that they're capable of building a team around them. They just haven't. Mm -hmm. No, and I have no belief that they ever will. And yet, if the market changes here and the number goes down, does it bring more teams in? Oh, I think it would. Now, once again, if I were a manager, you'd be thinking we're getting the hitter. That's the thing. We're Some teams will scratch him off immediately saying we can't do it because he... He's, we're getting a DH for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. And we can't justify spending $40 million a year on a DH. Mm -hmm. I think it'll have to be the owner. I think this is a rare situation where it's more, who is the bullish owner that walks in and says, go get him? But you go to see him, the multi-purpose Otani. That's who you go to see. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's what made him different. Is he the best bat in baseball? Probably. But it's up for debate. There's a lot of best bats. There's a lot of great bats. Yeah, Judge hit 62 bombs last year. You've got Matt Olson's putting together a season. You got Acuna. You got Tatis Jr. who's back in the mix. Juan Soto when he's on. There's a lot of great bats. But Harper, it's funny Trout. when you're talking to Brad Lidge where he goes with the Jays. It's mm -hmm. about Vladdy. Yeah. It's about Vladdy. Well, Vladdy's the poster boy for the issues at the plate. Bo is the volume hitter, but the spirit of the team seems to be about Vladdy. Vladdy like has he, the capability. He referenced him like three times or yeah. four times and said. Well, he mentioned Julio Rodriguez, who yep. he, that kind of is the similar role. A guy who can basically change the complexion of your whole team. With a swing. With a swing. And with a hot run. With a 15, 20 game run where this guy is absolutely lethal. We've seen those runs in the, in we the have, home run. We, we saw him multiple times. Well, we saw him at the home run derby. <laughs> but in, in uh, 2021, we saw it like multiple times. You can't hit 48 home runs without like two or three runs of, you know, 20 game segments where you are clear cut the most dangerous man on the planet. And it changes the way they pitch around you. Everything changes. In front of you, behind you, everything. Teams are not scared of Vladdy right now. They're, sc they're scared of his reputation. They're scared of his capability, but I don't think they're scared of the, the, zone, the zone he's in right now. He doesn't walk up with an aura. Funny to have an uncomfortable 20 home runs. Which he just got to. Mm -hmm. To be, they're the, they were. I think they were one of only three teams in baseball that did not have a twenty home run hitter on their roster this late into the season. And at this point, what's he going to get to? Twenty five, twenty seven. Not if he has the run you th say he's going to have. <laughs> well, I'm not. I'm not predicting he's going to have it. But listen, I, I I can't get there with this Blue Jay team, where I'm just going to predict they're going to snap out of it. It's just they, they shoot themselves in the foot way too often. They do, but somehow they remain likable. Like, they're as good at winning. When they win, they're so good at it, the way they <laughs> act. Aren't don't they? Well, like you're, they're great winners. You're right in terms of them having fun. Yeah, and they seem to have a professional aura to them when they win. Then it's, hey, Springer's a vet that knows what he's doing. Kiermaier, Belt, what a guy. When they lose, then all of a sudden... Yeah, Belt looks like the pickup for a couple of weeks. Varsho looked right. like he got it going. It, it turns into what happened with Varsho. What happened, why is Espinal in a situation like that? Where's Davis Schneider? Why can't he hit more? Right? And that became the conversation. What are they doing wrong? That's natural, I guess, in sports. Uh, Keegan Matheson, more on the Jays in about a half an hour from the park. Jays, Nats, tonight. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on TSN 2. Now, back to Overdrive with Hayes, Noodles, and the O-Dog. All right, Keegan Matheson in about a half an hour from the Rogers Center. No Bo Bichette tonight. Matt Chapman is on the IL. Jays with Washington in town tonight. Kevin Gosman on the mound. So the Jays are uh, they're in flux. We've talked about Toronto FC today. They have defined the term in flux really all season. But they're making changes. They hired John Herdman today. 
And Herdman needs no introduction. Herdman obviously is a massive part of the success of the national team on the men's side and the women's side part of that. And he comes in, and it's going to take them a while. It's going to take Toronto FC a while. You you get this deep into a really dark place, it takes a while for you to dig out. But they're trusting in Herdman to be a guy that can do that. They trusted Bob Bradley was going to be a guy that could do that, and we saw what happened. So Herdman's got a big job ahead of him, but I wouldn't suggest this is an upgrade in terms of profile necessarily, but it's definitely going to be an upgrade in terms of the amount of money he's making because MLSC would have paid for this. I think Herdman's taken advantage of a of a really leverage heavy heavy scenario. The team was just in the World Cup nine months ago. Right. I'm assuming these negotiations didn't start yesterday. And Herdman's been pretty outspoken about the lack of funding and the possible dysfunction within the ranks of the Canadian Soccer Association. And him jumping may reveal a lot about his uncertainty of whether or not they're going to figure it out. Well, the next hire will. Right, because you get the World Cup coming the here in 2026. Like we, so, we not, cannot be an embarrassment on the international level. Yeah, naive question. Do Are there club coaches that also coach countries not on the national level at the highest level it's a solo it's a sole gig. job yes side because they they go to it so many times during the year they play so many right and you're you're kind of the face voice representation of it even when the clubs you know the the seasons are in play you're still working and in most countries that would be the ultimate destination a lot in a lot of ways like there are a lot of prominent coaches that let's say Italy, Germany, or whatever, they would probably be well-known managers within the Bundesliga or Premiership or Serie A, and then they take that national coach job for a stint, and then maybe they go back. They go back. right? Like, rarely someone got the job for 20, 30. For, it's, it's generally a tenured gig where you understand at some point you're going to get off. Right. Um, but it's it can be a very lucrative job. It's a very high-profile job. John Herdman just got the most media he could possibly ask for by getting Canada the World Cup for the first time in, in over 30 years. He's taken advantage of that. Now, he didn't step into the premiership here, right? He's in MLS. It's a very good gig, mm-hmm. not the top of the mountain. And it probably says something about what you really have to do on the national stage to take that big of a leap. And maybe what he still has to prove. And maybe that's his long-term goal. Maybe he wants to get... He's an Englishman. Maybe he wants to get back there try to get into the premiership, and in order to prove that he can do it, he's got to take a club team to the next level. And that may have always been a part of his journey, but it leaves a vacancy on the national side. It should be a very sought-out gig. It should be. They're co-hosting the World Cup. You're in. And you got Alfonso Davies, Jonathan David. You've got really good young players. But do you step outside and turn it over to somebody? I don't know. Like, I mean, they did like really step with outside. They did with him, but although he, he was already also, in the country, he was here and he had the establishment of the women's game. Yeah, that uh, he'd done very well with. Going to be a fascinating. Like he would I have think, two six medals, months. I believe. He'd have two two bronzes. Yes, on the women's side. The women's side, yeah. although they were favored to win more than that. Uh, they uh, they were, were, yeah, and, and a, a part well, of that was the them, them the mix, hosting a mix. World Cup as well, right? In fifteen, he was still in charge at that point. Um, but yeah, Toronto FC, now they feel like they've got their guy and it's going to take some heavy lifting. We'll see what else they've got. As for the other, you know, other teams here in Toronto, the Raptors, they're going to be in camp soon. The Leafs will be in camp soon. And we talked about Austin Matthews, you know, obviously you and I weren't on the air last week when the news broke that he signed his deal, but the ripple effect that this can have on what Brad Trey living and company are going to try to do next, because Trey living, when he got here, like one of the first things he really tried to hammer home was that he, he's trying to get rid of the core four. He wants it to be about the team and not about the individual players. I don't believe this contract does that because it still suggests that Matthews is acting differently than other superstars around the league. But of the he core didn't take four, the eight years of the core four. He is the core. Yes. So I don't think we know until the next move. I agree with you, and I think that's that's where I was trying to get to here. I think with Matthews, Trey Living's hands were largely tied 
and he was going to try to get as many years as he could and get the cap as low as he could. And I'm sure he pitched Matthews on both. Matthews listened. They came to terms on a four-year extension. Let's not forget, he's got another year left five at 11.6. Yeah. So he's here for five more years. You've played on a lot of great teams. I'm sure there was the one guy that was different from, than everyone else. And I'm sure even in the room, you understood it. I'm sure you got to Boston, you realized that guy were in 77, probably a little bit different than everyone else. In terms of the way you would expect management to handle him. Probably number eight more than 77. Really? Cam Neely more so than Bork? Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. I find, like, was it considered in Boston Neely was the better player? No. More important player? No. Different. I, I think just different. It, it was like he had come in to the Bruins and mm-hmm. excelled far beyond, you know, whereas Bork was just, Bork had the complexity of being the Bobby Orr replacement. Right. With Brad Park in between. Mm-hmm. You know, and he fulfilled it. Right. Well, in he terms was of... almost more institutionally a Bruin than Neely was. Mm-hmm. Neely grew into it. But from from a contract standpoint, if you said, like, Ray wasn't going to hold out. Ray wasn't going to. You just knew he was going <laughs> to be there. Yeah, exactly. And well, they were going to make sure he was. Well, and that's, I guess what I'm saying is that's kind of what's happened here with Matthews. and Matthews is more Bork. Matthews is, is the institution. He's the marquee guy. He's, he's synonymous with being a Maple Leaf. Not that Marner is not. Not that Willie isn't. Not that Tavares isn't. And Tavares is different. He's got two years left. Everyone knows he's not making $11 million. But I don't know what his future is in Toronto, but he's here for two years. He's going to get paid. He'll be their captain. So on and so So that forth. is one step of the core four. So what happens next? That's one step of the core four. Because Tavares, again, isn't going to change in two years. No. But Willie is a year away. Marner is a year away from being able to negotiate an extension. Do you points. think they go at those two differently than they did Matthews? I do. I do. Because they I didn't really the last time. They did not. And it's a different group, and I would think they would learn from that. I mean, that, this is... It hasn't worked, and you're going to get another year to see if it does work. Mm-hmm. Or and you might get two more years with Marner and Matthews together to see if it does work. But if at the end of two years, Marner hadn't resigned and it hadn't worked, Tavares is leaving, not sure what happens with Willie. I mean, at some point you have to look around and say, can you see a world in three years where only Matthews is here? I could. It would be a major, major trade involved. Or maybe two. It would be, it, you know, it would be two. Something would happen with Willie, and if it hasn't worked with Marner to that point and Matthews together, why wouldn't why wouldn't you change? You well, just, you just keep rolling. That I mean, it's been seven years and they haven't changed, right? So in two years, well, they they're finally going to determine the general manager. Yeah, they. Although Shanahan made it quite clear he didn't want to, that was more Dubas that decided I'm changing. But it changed. It did change. Yes. So that's the first thing that changed. I just, you know, I, once again, I look at the, the calmness that happened when Brad Trilliving took over. It was just a, like it or not, it was, mm-hmm. a, it was a calm, there was a calm, steady hand. Yeah. And he got the deal done. I'm intrigued to see where it builds out. I really am. Yeah. And I think, again, it begins with the other, as much as, Brad, and I understand his his philosophy here, and I, I think he's right, but the fact is he can't control it. Because well, the alliteration they, works too well. Anytime you try and include Morgan Riley in the conversation, the he doesn't even get included. Four four doesn't work. Right. It's it's and and meanwhile he's the longest standing guy. He's their number one defenseman, which is a more important position than your second line right winger every single day of the week. I bet you a lot of people would have a hard time even telling you what his contract was. Yeah, you're right. You're right. In terms of the actual dollar amount, we and all how know long the other signed, ones to a dollar. Everyone knows the, the the rest of them. <laughs> so I understand where Trey Living is coming at and why he wants to change it, but it's it's really it's not going to change until one of them either leaves or the organization approaches it differently. And the fact is that couldn't happen with Matthews because he's core one. Yes, he's a part of the core four, but he's really core one. He is core one, and so. They were in a different place with him. The problem is Marner believes he's core 1A. Mm-hmm. 
And th that is my concern with what Matthews is, has decided to do here is that in this era, generally the players have the responsibility of establishing the salary cap culture. As much as that may not seem true, and you would think it would be incumbent on management to do that, every manager would prefer, like you, the famous Lou Lamorello, it's too long, too, too, much long money. too much money. Every GM wants you to sign for the league minimum for one year. That would be ideal. That doesn't happen naturally. But it has to start with a player, and it, if that is Patrice Bergeron or Sidney Crosby saying it's good luck because mm -hmm. it's number 87 and I make $8.7 million, what if he right. had number 98? Oh. Is that? <laughs> yeah, no, I understand. What's Connor Bedard say? But those are it's examples. Good luck. It worked for Sydney. It's good luck. Yeah, my number's not eight eighty-seven. Mm -hmm. It's ninety-six. But generally speaking, that the successful teams have had. They've had to. They've they've had players who have decided we are going to establish our own limits here, and since two thousand and five. Yeah. And again, I think that's very, it sucks for the players. And it's an exclusively NHL issue that the owners have created here with a hard salary cap that has absolutely no leniency and no flexibility whatsoever. And then you throw a pandemic on top of it, it makes it even more complicated. Yeah, the compression was... But the players generally dictate the salary cap culture. And what Matthews has dictated here was, he's not going for eight, and he wants another big one in five years or four years. Why would Marner and or Nylander listen to Brad Treliving suggesting he needs a different salary cap culture when the big dog decided this is how it's going to be? You better hope the cap's going up a lot. <laughs> I mean, that's the, mm -hmm. the one saving grace. Yeah. It's going to go up. Which it, it will, as long as we don't get hit with another Point. pandemic. <laughs> Knock on wood, we should be fine. Money's going to go up. Yes. But... They like I guess what I'm getting to is the Leafs at some point have got to put their stake in the ground, mm -hmm. and if it wasn't going to be for Matthews and it can't be for Tavares because the, the ink is dry, he's got well, two years of, left at eleven. One of the two remaining players is happening it's before the Elander or Marner. I think it's got to be both, quite frankly, because as much as I love Mitch Marner as a player, he it's is Nylander. he is not one A. Well, in, in that case, I'm I think the Leafs are fortunate that Nylander comes up first because they get to put the stake in the ground with him. Yeah. Well, and I've been saying this for months. If it takes all year, so be it. And if it takes all year and he walks, so be it. I think you're, you're establish, establishing a philosophy and a standard is incredibly important with this team. Well, when I was asked about that, though, with, with Nylander, and it's hard to establish the standard from the bottom up of the core four. And he's by far the bottom up. Yes. And, you know, he thinks he's taken his hit over the last four years. He's taken his hit for the last five years. And compared compared to... On a relative basis, compared to the guy sitting across the In the, the room, room. but not the scored, rest of the league. Who he scored more goals for him last right. year. Right. Not the rest of the league. And, and what I think Willie, and I'm sure Willie understands this, and his representatives represent, uh, understand this, you hit the open market. The open market doesn't care. No. The that Toronto standard. No. They don't care. They're not going to pay you $10 million because Mitch Marner got something. Not getting 90% of it in a signing bonus. No, and you're not getting it. You're not getting 90% on July 1st for the next six years. You may not get a full no trade, no move. Those July 1st numbers look good for Matthews. They look so. exceptional. And listen, I credit the Leafs. They have the money. Yeah, that's your one advantage. Go for it. You might as well use it. And that's something I'm sure they're trying to use with Willie. We'll pay you all everything you need on July 1st. But that's a huge benefit to being here. Enormous. In order to do that, though, we're not going to treat you as if you're better than Sebastian Ajo because we paid Mitch something mm -hmm. and made a mistake on that or went through it the last time with Austin and made a mistake on that. Trey Living has got to rectify the issues of the past administration. The thing is, Shanahan's still there. He's still in the room, and he was a part of it. So Shanahan, I'm sure, has to rectify it, too. He's got to be driving the force, driving the bus here. All right, more on the Jays Nationals tonight. Bo Bichette not in the lineup tonight. Matt Chapman on the I.L. What are the Jays going to do from here? We'll catch up with Keegan Matheson in about 15 minutes. Dave pulling in here. I'm Brian Hayes. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on TSN 2. Now, back to Overdrive with Hayes, Noodles, and the O-Dog. <laughs> All right, more on the Jays-Nationals coming up. 
golf season effectively over, though. I guess the Ryder Cup is still around the corner, which is going to be cool. But um, I don't know if you're hitting the ball like Victor Hovland these days, fully. But he's going to run to the Ryder Cup. I'll, I'll say this: that team Euro is going to be good. Rom McIlroy Hovland is better than any big three the Americans can oh. supply right now. Like no question, three of the top four in the world. Yeah, I mean Scheffler, but Scheffler can't putt. Scheffler's tee to green this year was an absolute clinic. It was basically Tiger in 2000, and yet he was putting like Happy Gilmore. He can't putt. He was first in shot and strokes gained in every category and something like 142nd in putting. It's amazing when you see him line up and you think he's going to miss. Yeah. He's that good. And he thinks he's going to miss. Well, the Lucas Glover stuff with the putter, though, mm-hmm. when he really talked about how the only way he was going to pick up the new putter was to go into the garage <laughs> and not let anyone see him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're talking about a guy who won a U.S. Open. Yeah, you got to have a lot of pride. I wonder if he had the lights turned on. I that. wouldn't be shocked if he did or didn't. <laughs> But Hovland, man, he put on a clinic this 25 weekend. Twenty-five years old. He is a super. He's a burgeoning superstar. That's what he is. And that's, yeah, but you've said that about a number of guys in the last couple of years. Well, a lot of that's good true. young golfers have gone through. Yeah, and he and even had their ups and downs. Like he came out with Morikawa. Morikawa's already got two majors. Mm-hmm. But Morikawa feels like he's dipped a little bit feels the last like year, dipped. year and a half. Um, JT he, is clearly JT. Dipped. Although it's sat reports are out there, Thomas is going to be on the Ryder think, Cup team. Yeah. That's because he's in, right? I'd like Zach a bigger Johnson. body. I like the big body of work. I don't mind that. Listen, he's and he's a raw, raw guy. It's an emotional tournament. Pairs well with Spieth. But is Spieth going to be? In? They're in Europe. Exactly. They're in Europe. The Europeans look good. It's going to be a fun tournament. It will be fun. It will be fun. Final hour coming up. Dave pulling in here. I'm Brian Hayes. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on the TSN app.